we can stop for one moment again. On actually Sunday, this coming Sunday, that we'll do the webinar, the weekly webinar. I will go over more how you tap or shift the attention more, more and more frequently to presence, which is you, the presence of awareness in the background. Today, because we are small group, we can take it any direction we want to. It's open, so we can go deep into any subject. I thought to read something short, and from there we we'll go out. So I'll share with you. It's a sweet book. It's called The Desire for Liberation. And in the introduction, everybody can, can hear well. Liberation or self-realization can be defined as bringing the imposter self to its final end so that you can remain eternally as your true self which is absolutely perfect, infinite awareness, love, bliss, that has never experienced any sorrow or suffering in all of eternity. The most effective aid to self-realization is awakening the extremely intense desire for liberation. The imposter self is very deceptive. In almost all humans, the imposter self's desire to continue its imaginary existence is much greater than its desire to be brought to its final end. Therefore, the imposter self uses numerous preservation strategies to ensure the continuation of its imaginary existence. The imposter self has millions of potential preservation strategies. There are as many potential preservation strategies as there are possible combinations of thoughts, beliefs, ideas, concepts, and opinions. The imposter self is thought and controls thinking. One of the imposter self's preservation strategies is to direct people's attention outward. Historically, the imposter self has almost always been successful. The imposter self has succeeded in enslaving almost all of the humans of the past. Not even one out of every 100 million humans in the past has attained liberation. This series of these books, the Self-Realization Series, is for the purpose of acquiring all the obstacles to liberation, one obstacle at a time. So let's open the floor if anybody has anything to share around that or questions. You can unmute and then can share or ask. Hi, Alon. Hi. Good to see you. How are you? Huh? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, what I was wondering is what, we, what you just read is essentially the mind masquerading as who you truly are. Again, the mind? Is the mind masquerading as who you truly are? Like of the word mask? Masking? Yes. That's a great question. Basically, 
there is what we call superimposition. There is the real I, which we can say it's the self, which is presence of awareness, changeless, which I invite you to recognize it even right now. Even as the talking happening or the listening is happening, there's a sense of presence within you, which is watching. It is absolutely silent and still. And then what happens, the I thought appears and it superimposes itself on who you truly are. And it does it double superimposition. One, it superimposes itself on who you are. And then the next thing it does, it superimposes itself on the physical body. So in the scriptures, they point it like to an iron ball mingled with fire. The ball and the fire get the attributes of each other. For example, the ball is heavy and cold. When it is in the fire, it turns to be liquid yeah, and hot. The fire has no weight, yet when it's mixed with the metal, then it turns to be, um, it has weight and it turns to be liquid. So the I thought appears within who you are, it superimposes itself on who you truly are and superimposes itself on the physical body. So it gets the attributes of who you are, which is changeless or its existence. It's always exists. It is conscious. It is conscious of itself. And it's always happy or peaceful or blissful. So the I thought think that it always exists as a real entity and that it actually uh, conscious of itself, although the I thought is not conscious of it, itself, it is conscious of other objects. And it thinks that it will find the happiness in the objects of the world or in itself. When it is superimposed on the body, it gets the attributes of the body, which is it has a beginning and the end. So the I thought says, I have a beginning and I have an end. I'm a physical form and I would find happiness in the objects of the world. Yet the I thought <coughs> doesn't have this, actually the attributes of, um, that's basically the, the mutual superimposition in a simple way. Okay. And the I thought really looks like the real I, yet it is not the real I. That's what we can say reflection is. Reflection, if we look at the mirror, there's only one thing real, the one who's standing in front of the mirror. So what happens, the, the, um, the real I is real. We cannot deny the objects because the object, as long as they appear, they appear to be real. So what happens, the I thought appears like the real self and the I thought appears like the physical body. So the I thought basically thinks that whatever it projects on the object is the object itself. So when I see a pillow and I say, this is a pillow, this is my projection, my projection is not the pillow itself. Because I can say the pillow is such and such, it's round, it's big, I like it, it's good, it's bad. The pillow remains a pillow. And with the I thought also gets the reflection of the self, the real self. So the I thought itself is the reflection of the real self and it is the reflection of the physical form. Yet the reflection looks like the real thing, yet it remains not the real thing. Just like when we are standing in front of the mirror 
the one who is standing in front of the mirror is real and the reflection appears like the real thing exactly, yet it remains unreal, just a reflection. We never brush our hair in the mirror. We brush our hair on the physical form, not on the reflection. We don't try to fix the reflection, we're changing our body posture and then reflect the reflection instantaneously, reflect what we see, what is happening in the body. So what we read, the imposter self is basically the mind. You, um used a phrase, the objects of the world can't, uh, you can't deny the objects of the world. This is something that I've often wondered about. When I see the eye arising and moving outwardly, it starts moving very fast and pulls with it all of these ideas of the, of the mind, the bundle of thoughts. And I'm not sure, are, they, are the objects of the, of the world real? Are they a, a superimposition that we create? If we perceive the object, or we have a thought about the object, and the thought is perceiving it, if we deny it, we validate its existence. Okay. If we don't perceive it, what does it mean? I'll give an example. If you can look through your eyes without a thought, just for a moment. So look if you have a thought right now. You check, everyone. Check if you have a thought. If you have thoughts, you're watching the thought. If there is no thought, your eyes continue to watch the object, yet you don't know what you're watching. That means there is a gap in the thinking process. Only when you recognize what you're watching, that's the mind rising and it labels what the impression that came through the eye is seen. Is that answers, that clarifies? Yes, thank you very much. When we, de now on the physical level, we cannot deny an experience. The experience is real. It's real because the experience of the self is shining through and it is experienced in the body, yet it's mixed with ideas or beliefs or translations in our mind. We label it pleasure, pain. I like it. I don't like it. I prefer this. I, I want to avoid that. That means there is a filtering in the experience. So when the filter of the mind drops for a moment, there is an experience yet you do not know what the experience it is. Don't try to understand it. Just rec recognize it just for an instant. The recognition deepens the knowing within you. It's like, we cannot understand what I'm pointing at, yet all can know it intimately, directly. It's innate. Thank you, that's very helpful. 
good. I'm very happy. Anybody else has questions? There's two things we covered that he mentioned in the book. Actually, we only read one thing. It's the most effective aid to self-realization is awakening the extremely intense desire for liberation. And if I continue, the two great keys are, that really support is the awakening, the extremely intense desire for liberation. And the second is self-honesty. Self-honesty begins by actually seeing the imposter self's preservation strategies, tricks, and deceptions. I'll just explain what I recognize through the years. Any desire one has, it's the desire for liberation. Because the desire is always to feel happy, to feel good, to feel amazing, to feel blissful, to feel open, to feel uh, expansion. Yes? So that's that desire, it just when it goes outwardly, it's split to so many objects, so many people, so many situations, so many circumstances. So I think it's, if I'll have this experience, then I'll be happy. If I'll get this, I'll be happy. If I'll, that's one desire. The other desire, I want to get rid of the uncomfortable experience. I want to get rid of pain. I want to get rid of fear. I want to get rid of that. It's the same desire because Basically, when I'm released from the unpleasant sensation or unpleasant thoughts, I feel a relief, which is a sense of happiness. Because basically, pain is just a concentrated energy. So pleasure is a released energy of that pain. So the extreme desire is there for everyone except when it's directed outward, it confuses the mind because then it's due to an object that I experience a relief or absence of the desire, which enables me to either experience peace or there is a sense of still veiling. I don't truly experience who I am, except I am not tormented by the desire that I wanted to fulfill. If I want something, it causes me restlessness. And once I get what I want, the desire is gone. So I'm released or relieved from that restlessness. Okay? So the intense desire is there for everyone. When it's directed inwardly, knowingly, and the mind merges into you, or the thoughts just... Um, what is the word blends or um, merges into the presence of awareness, which is infinite space, then there is a knowing that it is happening that takes place not due to an object externally. This is why Ramana always pointed out when you're consciously diving deep within yourself, you recognize that you are eternal, that you are the source of all happiness, that that happiness itself is the source, which is not different than yourself. And it can be happiness, not the happiness that we are familiar with. Happiness that, oh, I'm really happy that somebody so-and-so did what I like. No, it's not that kind of happiness because it can be with many different flavors. It, silence is a sense of happiness. When it's mixed with a particular vibration in the body, it can be a joy. It can be a sense of uh, elation. Yes? So that's why 
if you look for a particular experience to experience who you truly are as presence of awareness, that's the mind looking for something that is prior to the mind itself. It's a trap. The second key that is, is essential is honesty. And what he was pointing out that honesty is self-honesty begins by actually seeing the imposter self, the false self, preservation strategies, tricks and deceptions. Throughout the years, what I've seen within me Every time the mind comes with a different approach and trick to capture, it's a, to capture the attention of the self so it can follow and I would just be lost in a dream. Once it is seen and you see that it doesn't deliver, or causes you pain, then you can see the defect of it and you can shift the attention from it. Yes? There are also layers which I was playing through the past year, which am um, holding thoughts on a higher vibration. And holding thoughts on a higher vibration raises your vibration. Yet, what can happen? If it's directed outward, it charges an energy that your action will, when it is charged enough, the action will follow outwardly as well. If there is no conflict, it's okay, yet it's not enough. Can you elaborate a little bit on this last point you were talking about? Basically, we can uh, separate because in the, I'm talking about the mind. And so we'll break it. There is the physical body. There is the mind and there is the presence of awareness. In the mind, we have basically only two vibrations low vibration, high vibration. In the scriptures, they talk about the lower mind, the higher mind. The low vibration is negativity. High vibration, it's positivity. It's anything that inspires you, anything that enables you to open your heart, anything that brings you joy, um, thoughts that are positive. And they're closer to the source. So these kind of thoughts don't cause you pain. Yet what happens if it's directed outward, then you start taking action outward. And when you take action, action outwardly, that means few things. Either we give it significance, that means we give it meaning and we start to react to it and that's cause us pain. Up to here, it's clear? Yes, but if, if we're, let's say we're in the higher vibration and we're taking action, then, then this is a good thing, no? Yes, except you have to watch when you start taking action means you want a certain outcome. And when you are attached to a particular outcome, you start to react. It causes you, first of all, when I'm attached to a, a to an outcome, I am always feel tension. Do you recognize that? Yes. That's where it's really fine to see, okay, I am holding a higher vibration, creating anything that I want, and then to see when do I start to get attached and because the, there is always contrast be, between the circumstances of life and my thoughts about the circumstances, I might start feeling dissatisfied with the circumstances because I start getting attached to what I want, which is a higher vibration. Do you recognize it? 
I recognize um, the attachment for for wanting to be in high vibration all the time. It's not to a specific thing. Um, I guess that's where my question was kind of coming from is just that I recognize now that there's things in the world that um, like objects and things outside of me that I can use in a sense to um, raise my vibration. So I guess it's okay as long as there's not a, an attachment for me to these things and to recognize that while these things um, point me towards my higher self, they still are not my higher self. Yeah. Okay, so few things that enables me to touch, which is very good. Thank you for sharing. Is there is no problem when I recognize there is attachment within me. Because when there is the recognition of attachment within me, and I see it instantaneously, it is freed. If I ask a question after that, then it lose it withdraw the energy even from it. So if I say I'm attached and I can ask a question and then it generates a bodily sensation which is not not pleasant, which is actually tells me that my compass is working to see that this is not natural for me to feel negative or bad or unpleasant sensation. And that triggers the question within me, like, from where am I watching this attachment? Who is aware of this attachment right now? What is it within me that never gets attached? And I explore by asking the question not looking for an answer, just staying with the experience, with the sense of I amness, which is always present for everyone. That discharges the energy of the attachment instantaneously. The most important is that there is no conflict. Like, let's say I use the mind to create something I want that makes me feel good. In that moment, I already have the experience of feeling good. If I, my attention goes out and I see that I don't have it in the circumstances, that's when I start to have conflict with the circumstances, circumstances immediately. What I don't recognize is all creation happens in the mind only. Means because life is only now, that means that thoughts appear in the field of awareness and the thought can be defined either memory past or future imagination. Yet that's a definition I imposed on the thought itself, which appears right now. If I recognize it and I use the mind to hold on to thoughts to a higher vibration, I don't look out through my senses on the circumstances to see if it's happening or not. This is the power of true manifestation, is that you manifest whatever you want internally and you leave the circumstances and allow it to form itself in a mysterious way. Then you don't have a conflict and, or neither pain.
So I'll share a story. And that story is regarding discrimination. Discrimination between opinion and fact. The story is about a young boy and a Sufi master, an old man, and they were walking with a donkey. And as they got closer to a village, the master told the boy, look, why don't you get up on the donkey so we're not going to attract too much attention? So the boy went up on the donkey. So they were walking, the old man holding the donkey in front, carrying the boy or holding the donkey and the boy is on the donkey. And a group of people came and say, what is this? This is truly disrespectful. This old man walking and the boy is on the donkey. This is disgrace, disgrace. So they switched. The old man went on the donkey and the boy started walking by the donkey. So they continued through the village and then a group of people said, came and said, what this, this is? The old man is on the donkey and the boy is walking. This is disrespectful. So they decided both of them to get on the donkey. So they were walking through the village, both of them riding the donkey. And a group of people come and say, wow, this is inhumane. Your, your weight is so heavy on the donkey, you're going to break his back. So they decided to get off the donkey and they took a big, large bamboo and tied the donkey legs to the bamboo. And then the old man and the boy were carrying the donkey upside down. As they were leaving the village, there was a big river that they had to cross and there was a narrow bridge. So they slowly, gently carrying the donkey upside down with the bamboo crossing the river slowly, slowly, and then the boy's leg slipped and he left the bamboo that, was, that the donkey was tied and the donkey fell into the river. Now his legs are tied to the bamboo and he starts to go with the flow and he's drowning. By the time they ran down to, and were able to get to the donkey, when they pulled the donkey out from the river, the donkey, the donkey drowned and died. And the, the old master told the boy, look, this is the lesson for you. If you're going to listen to everyone's opinion, you'll end up like the donkey. The facts is what happened. The opinion is what you think about what happened. I think this is really good. I think this is really bad. What is, is just the way it is. This is the fact. If you can discriminate between opinion and fact, you'll have much more clarity. Yes? And there are a lot of people, because I recognize the truth of who I am, they come and they ask my opinion. And they think that my opinion can be superior than somebody else's opinion, which is false. It cannot be true. My opinion will be one opinion, and there can be a contradicting opinion to the same fact. Both will be an opinion. So they, con they can contradict each other because that's what the mind does anyway in duali duali duality. One says good, and the other one said the same event or circumstances is bad. Who is right? Both are right. And both are mutually wrong. Because it's not, the circumstances are not good nor bad. They're just the way it is. That's the fact. Yes? Knowing to discriminate between the two can help everyone a lot. And it can help someone to discriminate when they hear someone else's opinion or when they hear a fact. 
Another example of a fact that is not circumstances is how your mind operates. The way your mind and my mind and everyone's minds operate on the fundamental levels is the same. This is true knowledge, which is not the ultimate truth. It's just a pointer for one to see what is not true within themselves and realize the ultimate truth, which has nothing to do with this duality of good and bad, right and wrong, I like it, I don't like it, love, hate, and so forth, contradictions. So that's another example was of a fact of how the mind functions. It just uses different symbols in each one. That's all. And one of the examples of facts is a story of a woman who came to Buddha and she said, I've lost a dear person of mine. You, I know you have so much power and you have so much grace and you know the truth. Please help me. And he told her, I don't know if I can help you. You're the only one who can help yourself. Except take a vase and from clay and pour oil into it. Fill it with oil. Go to the river or to the lake where there's deep water and throw the, the, the vase of clay with the oil into the water. And now we ask her, once you throw it, try the vase to, to float and the oil to sink. So because she was obedient, she went, she did what he told her, and she took the vase and threw it with the oil into the lake. And now she was trying to pray to get the oil to, to sink and the, the vase of clay to float. And guess what? It didn't really work. And this is where she came back to Buddha and he asked her, were you able to change it? And she says, no. And he told her, I cannot change it either because there's a universal law of nature that operates in the relative world, in the mind and what's around us, that it's going to play itself the way it does. And you cannot, even if you have a different opinion about it, it's not going to change the facts. So these are the two stories to, to just so you get an idea about the difference between an opinion and a fact and to discriminate it in different levels, basically. Anything you like to ask or share? How can we make the most out of the time together here? We can touch any direction, any subject, anything you want to. Hi, Alan. 
Hi, it's Dennis. Yes. Hi, Dennis. Hi, how are you? Um, just when you're speaking about action. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I didn't understand. Sorry, when you were speaking about action, yes. and not to get attached to the action, uh, how do we set goals then? Let's say if we want to achieve something in life. Setting goals can be very that makes useful. Sense. What? Sorry? Dennis? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. The goal and the journey, both are very important. Because when you have a goal, you can focus the mind on the journey. The journey is what counts. The goal will reveal itself in a way that you cannot even imagine or predict. Means, if I take it to a lower mind and a higher mind, the lower mind perceives the circumstances from, the, from life. The higher mind creates what you want. Once it creates what you want, the universe will respond to it in a very unpredictable way, in the most harmonious, in the most amazing way. It will bring it to you. So you, can, you cannot know how the, what will be the outcome. So the goal and the journey are important because the goal enables you to focus your mind. What is it that you want? So what I, what I realize is try to focus only on what you want. When you focus on what you want, when you think about it and that makes you feel happy, peaceful, rested, clear, then you're in alignment with the expression for, of yourself. Yes, I, I think there's a, there's a bit of a contradiction coming up in me because when I say set a goal, let's say I want to achieve something and then you, you kind of let go and get in contact with the, your higher self or your inner self with that stillness and you just allow it to happen. It's a kind of a contradiction to have a goal and, allow it, and just allow it to happen. Does it, Basically, you know, a goal is a dream. So if you consciously dream, and that dream means you directing your mind consciously, in that moment, manifestation is already happened. Where are we are falling? Where is the trap? We go out through our senses to life circumstances, and we say, we don't have it. It's not happening. Because out of habit, we believe that the circumstances is more real than our thoughts that created the circumstances. We reverse the order. The order is, the presence of awareness and then the mind starts to dream because the whole mind is a dream and then there is the manifestation of the physical world that's the order of creation thought feeling action result so if you yeah. that you have a goal and you dream and that dream makes you feel good and you keep dreaming it, eventually when it is enough charged with energy, you will take action towards this direction. You won't even be able to stop that action. It's almost 
will be unconscious drive you because you pumped that energy into that dream. Of course, the, the Bhagavad Gita speaks of this as well, dropping the fruits of action. What? The, the Bhagavad Gita speaks of that as well, dropping the fruits of action. Yeah, if you can just... Dream on the highest, highest good for all, highest good for yourself, highest service, highest openness, eh, the most loving, the most giving, the most generous, the most that would purify your mind and eh, would um, build an urge to take action, you would start acting by this dream. Is it fair to say that that's what's coming up for you and that's why you are doing things like this meeting and your YouTube clips, etc.? The reason why I'm doing it because I have a dream. And the dream is to empower and inspire millions of beings to awaken to their highest potential, to awaken to who they truly are. So what drives me is my dream. I'm doing it for myself. Maybe people don't want to say this thing, yet that's the truth. Anything you do is for yourself. I'm just honest enough to say that. Because some people would say, no, we do it for you. That's Polonis. The you is in their mind. I project you, others, millions, and then I'm dreaming it. And I follow this dream because it makes me feel inspired. It resonates for me. It keeps me around the subject. You're doing a very good job. I'd like to thank you very much personally because I find your YouTube clips extremely helpful. My dream is to actually create um, a school, academy, however, I, I think I'm going to call it the Academy of Self-Awareness. And, and it's going to be really seeing in your daily life how to shift your physical form. So I'm going to share about nutrition and how nutrition affects your mind, your body and mind, how detoxification. I'm going to share many things that I've done for so many years and how to live in a as a well-being, as a, on the physical and different exercises and different practices and really share the knowledge in such a way that it will be um, available to everyone on the internet. And my vision was always that it will be free and available for everyone. And then the next step that's going to happen, there would be a physical space that people can come from all over the world and go through transformation physically, mentally, and spiritually. And the vision is that it's going to be for free and that it's going to continue for many generations to come.
So that's my dream. Excellent dream. And I invite people to be part of the dream if that's they have a dream. And wake up through the process. Be awake to the dream and awake to who they truly are. Would, would I be, would say, sorry? Waking up from the dream while you're dreaming. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I was just about to say, are you having a dream in a dream? So that was helpful for you, Dennis? Yes, very much so. Thank you. If someone still has a dream, a vision, a goal, and you try to deny it, you're creating a conflict internally within you. So, in Bal ask a question, if you don't know what your dream is, then if you don't know what your dream is, fix your attention on that which is prior to the dream itself. Alan. Yes. You speak of the academy and uh, um, possibilities of that. How, if at all, how may we help or how may I help?
I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let Fair you enough. know, truly. Uh, uh, we, we can get help. Each one has something that they can contribute. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dennis again. Okay. I saw Daniel Just, uh, in a moment. You wanted to ask something? Yes. Yeah. So, Dennis? Yes. Does Daniel want to ask a question? Let, yeah. Uh, let Daniel ask. Okay, thank you. So, um, you keep coming back to, uh, and Chris will keep to come back to the theme that there's only one and the one is me, but there seem to be others that you can't control their actions and no matter how much you're, you know, committed to ahimsa and you're, you're not hurting anybody, there seem to be all the time others acting in ways that you would not act. So how are you, how can you still assert that there's only one? So first of all, I barely heard you. Can you can you try it again slowly? Can you repeat again slowly? Okay. Um, what's the sound now? Now it's a little bit better. Okay. Um, so there is, um, according to the mystical tradition, there is uh, one, and that the Atman and that's your self, your true nature. But we always are coming against others that are doing things that we don't want them to do, or I'm coming against others. So am I mistaken about what I want, or are those others actually myself? Okay, I'm not sure that I could hear properly so um, is it does it sound good now mm, not so much so let's see if i understood is thinking there are no others right and then coming in contact with others uh, when they don't do what you want or what you don't like. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What happens when the I thought appears, it projects a physical form, it perceives it, and right away what it does, it says, I am a physical form in the world. That happens instantaneously. So the moment I wake up from the dream into the waking state, I feel that I am a physical form in the world. Okay? Uh, uh, that's clear up to now? Yep. Once I perceive the others, I cannot say there, there are no others. That would be a lie. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I have to come to these terms. If I perceive another, there is another for me in my perception. Saying that there is no other when I see another, that would be a lie. Okay, now I have to recognize that the other is not really ever affecting me. It's my interpretation about the other that is affecting me only. That means the thoughts I'm having about the other are the only one that are affecting me. That means my feelings, the thoughts that I'm having because that's all I can experience, is the thoughts and the feelings that are generated in the physical body. That's it. 
even when I feel now the air, I perceive it in my mind and in the physical body, the interpretation of the sensation. I cannot feel the air outside of me. Okay, that's clear? Mm -hmm. Or no? Yeah, I think so. We can only experience what I call the reality and our thoughts about the reality. The reality is what we experience in the field of the physical body, okay? And our thoughts about the reality. The thoughts is our world, the reality is the bodily sensation. So if I have a physical pain, that's my reality, it's not yours, okay? If I'm in a story trapped, this is really bad, I don't like it, that's your world about your reality. It doesn't mean that I have the same experience and I have the same kind of thoughts. Is that clear up to now? I'm not no. following. Huh? What? Uh, sorry, I'm not following. You're not following. Okay. This. So ask me again another. Okay. You're saying there's a story and that story only exists in my head and there's a, an understanding of the world and it's not actually out there, but it's in my head, right? So the story in our mind, we can say it's in our head. The voice in our head, just to make it simple in the beginning. It's not completely true, yet for most people, it's more easy for us to understand. Okay? Because we feel that it is in our head. Okay. What's affecting you, me, and everybody is our thoughts that generates a feeling in the body. So we either react to the feelings we don't like or re react to the thoughts we don't like or we react to the feelings we like means we want more of them and we react to the thoughts that we like we want more of these kind of thoughts yeah okay that's clear yeah now somebody does something in life circumstances and basically you have a choice how to perceive it automatically you might say i don't like it this shouldn't happen you argue with what is happening this should not happen he shouldn't speak to me that way he shouldn't behave to me that way okay that that reaction cause you pain, frustration and anger. Because he is behaving the way he was behaving. That's already over, it's finished. Because we always interpret the circumstances a moment later in our mind. I'll give an example. You walk down the street and somebody, you see somebody, and you say, mm, his behavior is really bad. Or you see another, that's enough, yes? So it's always after. If you didn't see him, you wouldn't have the thought about that person. Okay? This reaction is automatic. Once you recognize this reaction, you have a choice how to approach that reaction in your mind. So the reaction was automatic. You saw the person and you think he's behaving in a really bad way. Okay, automatic. Now you can ask yourself, who would I, how would I see this circumstance, the same behavior without any interpretation?
Who would I be without these thoughts? That's one way. Another way you can say, okay, he, he, the way he behaves is really bad. And you realize that it generates an unpleasant sensation in your body. So you choose, I choose to let go of it and set myself free. So the choice that one has when they're conscious is how to respond to what came up in the field of awareness automatically. Let's say I sit in front of the computer and I do something and I'm impatient. I start to be restless. I don't like it. I want to finish it. That's automatic reaction out of habit. Yes? Now I can say, okay, I'm watching it and I choose to let go of this reaction, reactivity and set myself free. And then I can choose to think, oh, I really love that I noticed that. I'm so excited and happy that I could let go of this reactivity, that I could choose even to approach it in a new way and set myself free. So I basically left the, the, the computer, the circumstances, or the person that I was thinking he's really behaving really bad because I noticed that my thought caused me to feel bad or my automatic interpretation caused me to feel bad and not the person. Am I clear? Can I be honest? What? Uh, can I be honest? Yes. I would, it seems like sometimes this idea that the person behaves badly is, is helping. Like that's my, my ally, if I can say that, because I don't know if like, it, how can you have order in the world unless somebody actually says, this is a good way to act and this is a bad, As, otherwise we would just have complete chaos, you know? And, and I need to be, I think, I need to be that person to say, this is not the right way to act. So I guess this is still kind of the mind imposing something, but what do we have if we don't have that, you know? It, so we, we just allow people to act badly Is that the answer? I guess that's a, also an interpretation that I say they're acting badly. But. The more you're connected to your true self, you feel more harmonious. When you would do something that disturbs another, you will feel really so out of alignment. Because we collectively forgot who we are, then we are operating and doing horrendous, horrendous things on the planet to ourselves, to each other, to the planet itself, because we are so out of touch. So what I suggest first, get in touch with yourself. And then from that experience and clarity, meet the others with clarity and understanding and compassion, not necessarily agreeing with their behavior just understanding that if you would be in the same, if you would be exposed to whatever they exposed, the same life experience, the same level of consciousness, you might be behaving exactly like that.
Yet, if they are behaving in a bad way and you, let's say they are aggressive and you judge them aggressively in your mind, you're pretty much very similar to them, except maybe you didn't let it fully be expressed verbally or physically, yet the aggression is playing inside you. The frustration is playing inside you. When they are aggressive, they, the frustration was leading to them. It's like, it's frustration, anger, violence. That's the order. So if you can clear it out from your system, at least you'll approach it with more understanding and clarity. This horrendous behavior, this, this whatever that you perceive with more compassion and love and understanding. I think this is a better, better way. Because when we're confused, we try to resolve violence with more violence. It perpetuates the same vibration. So we are, we are with war with drugs and war with uh, the violence and we, we just perpetuate the same vibration basically. Because everything is a vibration. So whatever you are vibrating in your mind and in your physical body, you either attract into your life or you are meeting the same vibration more often. What if, just a thought, what if you would have only one thought No, three thoughts, okay? And that would be the only thought you only think. Wow, it's amazing. So you see somebody and you say, wow, it's amazing, and you think it. And you see another thing, it's like, wow, it's amazing. Everything, it's wow, it's amazing. You feed, you eat. Something stale and you're like, wow, it's amazing. Everything, it's wow, it's amazing. How would your world would be if that's the only three thoughts you have in your program? Wow, it's amazing. I think I would feel a little bit stupid except you wouldn't have this self-judgment because only you would have, wow, it's amazing. You can explore this yourselves. You just choose to think, wow, it's amazing, for 30 minutes or during the day as much as you can. See what is your experience.
Dennis, can I read your question? Yes, please. So Dennis wrote, I had a thought when Chris asked, how could we, he help? What about we? I form, I form groups in our area of people who are awakening or interested in waking up. So these groups could meet and ask you questions and share their experiences with you on Zoom or some other kind of technology. What do you think? I'll be more than happy to to meet in Zoom or any form of technology and we can uh, open the space for people to be established in the knowing of who they are, have clarity. I'll be more than uh, honored to do that. Thank you. You can write me on the email and then we can set something up if you wish. Dennis, did you hear it? Yes. And you have the email, right? Yes, I do. Okay. I, I don't, at this moment, I don't know many people. Uh, maybe five or six Doesn't uh, would be interested. In. Doesn't Sorry. matter. Doesn't matter the numbers. Yes, 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 yes. Today we are yeah. just very small group. And the other webinars we were many more people, it doesn't matter. And Sunday we'll see how many people. We're gonna send out an email soon about the webinar on Sunday at 10 o'clock. I just yes, uh, ten the opportunity for this, for people if they want to open and do it in a different manner today, that's all. Is that uh, 10 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time? Yeah, it's going to be the same time, just like we did today. You'll receive it in the email. Okay. So maybe just to summarize, keep examining what's going on inside you. It's like monitor your feelings, thoughts, and notice what is always here, presently aware. Discriminate between opinion and facts. Watch what is really affecting you in your life. Is it circumstances, people, objects, or it's thoughts that you're having, reacting to either bodily sensation or reacting to other thoughts? The more you're clear that you're reacting to thoughts that you don't like or reacting to thoughts that you like, by getting attached to them or reacting to feelings you don't like 
or you're reacting to feelings that you do like, wanting more of those, you would have more clarity that only your mind is affecting what is apparently you. This brings you clarity. So you can move from what's not clear, from a mind that is not clear to instantaneously a mind which is clear. And I know that for some or for all of us, at times it can be very confusing. I'm reacting to the circumstances or to a person and I'm sure it's because of the person. He makes me feel bad. Yet when you start to be honest and examine, you start to realize it's your thoughts that make you feel bad. And then you can choose how to approach these thoughts because they were coming up into the surface automatically. Only a conscious being can have the choice. If I'm not conscious of it, it's automatically, so I cannot choose how to approach the thoughts or the circumstances. or, sorry, the thoughts and the feelings. Is this clear? Good, so we will uh, stop for today, tonight. And um, we are meeting again on Sunday and you're welcome. And Chris, we can uh, communicate via email or Skype and I can share with you uh, how you can be of help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Lon. Thank you. Blessings your way. Be successful. Thank you.